không ngồi quên là những cái thứ sẵn Restart. Restart. What we wait? <laughs> it's supposed to be shelf for a minute. So, uh, uh, I'm very glad to have a uh, Professor Kim Aromi today from University of Barcelona. So, he studied um, chemistry in University of Barcelona and Strasbourg diploma. And PhD in Indiana University in the US. And now he's full professor in the University of Barcelona. So he's experts in uh, synthesis and functional uh, properties of new coordinate uh, chemistry complexes and supramolecular assemblies. So today he will talk about heterometallic non-sanized coordination complexes for quantum technology. So let's welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for this uh, kind introduction. And above all, I thank you for the invitation to come here to deliver some uh, uh, research uh, talk about uh, what we're doing in Barcelona. Uh, it's the first time I give a talk here in uh, Donostia, so it is uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And so, uh, as uh, the young mentioned, uh, I am a chemist, so we uh, design and prepare new molecules in our lab at the University of Barcelona, and with the aim of uh, finding uh, applications or finding uh, things to learn from these molecules. And so uh, today I'm going to uh, describe a quite a peculiar method of preparing uh, lanthan and coordination complexes that are heterometallic, which is the uh, let's say the uniqueness, the uniqueness of uh, of this uh, of these uh, uh, systems. And uh, today I'm going to try to uh, explain how we can find a possible application or use of these uh, peculiar systems uh, for uh, quantum technologies. So to pushing or promoting uh, molecules, uh, specifically the spin within molecules for uh, uh, quantum technologies. I'm aware that uh, this is a big center on quantum technologies and quantum computing. Uh, there is a quantum computer that is uh, uh, due to arrive, uh, I guess, uh, within a few months. So I think this is a quite a relevant topic uh, for uh, for uh, this uh, this. Uh, research area in Donostia. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to give just a very brief uh, uh, introduction. I think we have a problem with the battery. Let's say with the other one. Maybe then you just to make it. Yeah. Okay, let's go to this. Okay, sorry about this. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, let me just give a very, very brief introduction on some very few, uh, let's say, concepts or very simple concepts of, of quantum computing. Uh, again, it maybe it's the computer. Maybe it has to be like this. No, no. Yes. I think so, yeah. Okay. So now I have a focus around this. Anyway, uh, quantum computing is a concept of processing information that goes way, way beyond of what we uh, know about uh, processing of information. In classical computing, we have uh, the uh, information encoded in uh, bits 
which can be in two states, two microscopic states, zero and one. So this is a memory, and we can do logic operations with uh, with uh, the the, the uh, this information. <clears throat> But in quantum computing, we move from the classical bit to the so-called quantum bit. And so the, the, the uh, analogy is that uh, we have the information encoded in two quantum states. And uh, so as it turns out, a system that can have two quantum levels not only can be found in, in, in these two states, but of course, on any of the uh, positions that are represented in the block sphere. So uh, that means an infinite number of possible superpositions between these two states. So this is a resource that quantum mechanics offers you to uh, encode a quantum bit, and also not only to encode the quantum bit, but also to process the information that is uh, encoded in this way. So these are our things, for example, uh, like the so-called quantum parallelism, or to implement uh, algorithms, um, quantum, uh, quantum computing uh, uh, algorithms that uh, I, again take advantage of resources of quantum mechanics, such as the quantum entanglement, etc. So, in a way, it's not only a, a, a matter of miniaturizing, miniaturizing uh, the processing of information or speeding up, it's uh, a matter of also accessing uh, things that are really unthinkable or, or impossible to assess the way we handle uh, information uh, currently. <clears throat> so of course, this is this is going to bring us to a, another level. And so this is why there is so much interest on in this and a lot of efforts being devoted to this, to the point that indeed already, of course, as you know, uh, quantum computing is already being implemented with different technologies. And so um, in any case, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, what is the best physical system we need to use to uh, realize this, uh, this uh, 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 processing of information? <clears throat> Here we have very basic requirements. For the most basic qubit, of course, uh, then uh, we need just two quantum levels. Uh, there is an issue which is the one of scalability because uh, to, to, to realize complicated uh, procedures and algorithms, we need to have uh, many qubits uh, wired and uh, interacting. So it, it is necessary to have a system that is amenable to scalability. And uh, uh, another very crucial aspect is uh, the quantum coherence. So as I mentioned, the information of the qubit is encoded as uh, in form of a superposition that we then use uh, to process uh, and to do uh, logic operations. And so we uh, need to be able to do that before this very fragile, uh, uh, let's say, uh, form of qubit information uh, is maintained. So that means that the so-called quantum coherence of the physical systems we, we use to encode quantum information needs to have long quantum coherence. And so this is crucial also for the, uh, let's say, the uh, reliability of, uh, of, uh, of uh, physical implementation of, uh, of quantum computing. <clears throat> so uh, here I show three of the most, let's say, important uh, systems that are currently being actually developed to realize quantum computing. There are many more systems that are interesting and are being uh, studied very seriously. And perhaps those are the three superconducting circuits, trapped ions, uh, called uh, uh, trapped ions or photons. Those are systems that are actually being used already in real quantum computers. So um, this is a race that is actually being pushed with a very uh, lot of strength and uh, for now several years. And so it's, of course, uh, and this is why we hear a matter of uh, research to uh, um, it's a complement the systems or to optimize whatever physical system we use for, for doing this. And so uh, here, uh, this is where chemists come into, 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 into place <clears throat> because uh, one interesting uh, system or quantum system to encode quantum information is the electronic spin or the nuclear spin. Uh, here I just mentioned the electronic spin. Here is a cartoon. A very simple cartoon illustrating very well how a spin can be a two quantum uh, level system. And so uh, there are many systems that are being, that use the spin as a possible you know, quantum bit. 
But of course, uh, one that we can slide very much and in fact offer great opportunities are uh, the spin that is uh, uh, carried by molecules uh, in form of ampere electrons. So in fact, uh, molecules are, uh, let's say, our systems that are, have infinite versatility. So we can use chemistry to uh, implement things that are unthinkable uh, with other other systems. So that's why we believe that this is an interesting, a very promising uh, alternative to uh, make or realize uh, uh, quantum bits. <clears throat> so uh, with molecules, we we can have uh, atomic control on the on the on the number and the size of the of the uh, of the the physical systems that carry out the qubits. Uh, we can, for example, uh, uh, play with the isotope control to implement, in fact, uh, several uh, 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 qubits. In this case, would be qubits. For example, uh, uh, having spins coupled or or having or exploiting also the nuclear spin. We can break symmetry, parity. We, as I mentioned, we can uh, engineer qubits or qubits. And we can also embed into molecules uh, complicated uh, architectures of space. So we can carry out with single molecules complicated protocols, like, for example, uh, uh, error correction mechanisms into one single molecule, which, uh, very, which usually error correction requires wiring up uh, a large number of qubits, making actually architectures very, very complicated. <clears throat> so molecules can be actually very interesting for this kind of problems. So a few years ago, we, uh, we were somehow very few chemists, uh, in fact, uh, interested in this. So we, we put together our review on, on what had been uh, proposed and made at the time uh, in, in the use of molecules as uh, spin carriers for, uh, for quantum computing. And so here it showed just uh, uh, an illustration of the uh, variety of systems that we have been working uh, in our laboratory to uh, use molecules of different ways and in different manners as possible as spin qubits and more important here in this talk, uh, multi qubit spin quantum gates. Because uh, many, a lot of work has been done on uh, optimizing the performance of molecules as uh, qubits, for example. Uh, in finding ways of optimizing the quantum coherence or uh, working with them on different uh, substrates, etc. But uh, there, it, it hasn't been so uh, important the efforts on working with molecules containing more than one qubit and having them uh, realize possibly uh, multi qubit quantum, quantum uh, large, uh, gates. Okay? And so we have to actually be focused on this, on multi qubit systems. Uh, now for, for quite a bit. And so today I'm going to talk about those that are made with several uh, lanthanides in one moment. <clears throat> so for this, I'm going to just show very quickly uh, a very uh, archetypal uh, two qubit quantum gate, which is the uh, so called C naught quantum gate, control naught quantum gate. And why uh, is it called control naught? Because this, uh, this this gate has two qubits that are not equivalent. One is called control, the other one is called target. And what it does, so here is the uh, here is the uh, uh, the inputs of this uh, of the computational basis of this two qubit system, and that will be the output uh, after realizing this uh, quantum gate. What it does is it flips the state of the target only if the control is in the position. Or a predetermined position, which in our case would be bad or one. Okay, so here, for example, it goes from uh, the target goes from from one to zero, here from zero to one because the control is one. Whereas in the other two <coughs> inputs, there is no change. This is what the uh, zero quantum gate does. Okay, and this is an important quantum gate because uh, with this you can uh, and, uh, on single qubits you can make a universal set of quantum gates. So you can do. Uh, uh, in principle, any any algorithm of quantum work. So with molecules, uh, what we have is uh, well, we have some examples of, of people that have uh, uh, 
presented molecules as potential as prototypes of two quantum gates. So essentially, they are molecules that have uh, two level systems, uh, a pair of two level systems, which are not equivalent. Here, for example, is a pair of radicals that they don't look uh, different, but they are good because uh, this molecule is asymmetric. <laughs> This is a pair of uh, doublets uh, that uh, are uh, uh, incorporated into, this, into these clusters. So those are rings that have an S equal one half ground state. So they are not equivalent either. So here we have also a possible uh, two qubit uh, quantum gate. And this is a more recent example where we can see clearly here is a vanadium and a copper, S equal one half, each of them. And therefore, uh, of course, uh, not equivalent. And uh, so this is another example. So basically, what I'm now in the, in the first part of the talk going to present is how we make uh, signal quantum gates using uh, lanthanide complexes. Okay. So in order to make a signal quantum gate using a lanthanide complex, what we uh, what we need is to have uh, two equivalent lanthanides in one molecule. Okay, a control and a target. They need to be coupled, okay? So this is a condition of case. So in, in a way, uh, what, uh, what, what the one lanthanide one Q needs to do depends on what is the state of the other Q. That's why they, they, they have to be coupled. And so we, we, uh, uh, we use actually an isotropic molecules, or sorry, uh, lanthanides, because we use the uh, uh, ground state doublet and as effective S equals one half. Of, uh, this, uh, of these ions as the realization of the QB. So if we have this uh, system, we have uh, the, this uh, is, uh, in this case, uh, the case of an empty ferromagnetic complex, uh, complex. We have two, uh, two states uh, of, of the ferromagnetic, uh, the two ferromagnetic states uh, they generate, and then and at the ground state, we have the two anti ferromagnetic uh, possible uh, states uh, having both qubits uh, uh, anti-parallel, either in, in in one direction or in the other. <laughs> so uh, we have two degenerate doublets, but uh, since these two qubits are not equivalent, uh, of course they have a ferromagnetic state depending on the orientation of this uh, overall magnetic moment with an external magnetic field. We're going to have a splitting, but also. <clears throat> In the case of the anti ferromagnetic state, we also have a splitting because these two lanthanides are not equivalent. So they have a different response to the magnetic field. And so this, they don't somehow don't cancel each other, even if they are anti ferromagnetic. And anti ferromagnetically. So the result is that we have the four states of uh, two qubit systems with uh, different spacing uh, among each other, which constitute what we need. To uh, how to realize a quantum uh, signal quantum gate. For example, if we need to uh, generate, uh, induce the rotation corresponding to the signal quantum gate, if we consider that this uh, large arrow, like the control qubit, and the other one, the uh, uh, targeted qubit, we would realize the quantum gate undergoing this transition of this rotation where we flip the target if the control is in their position. So we can, if we have an energy source that corresponds to this particular energy gap, we can do the magnetic field so we reach this energy gap for the resonance corresponding to this uh, transition. And so in this case, we would have made a signal quantum gate. So if we go to chemistry, now we go to chemistry, finally, how we do that? So basically, we think of a ligand uh, uh, that is able to bind in uh, lanthanide ions uh, so that they are connected to each other, but they are kept in different uh, chemical environments, thereby making them inequivalent. Okay. So in fact, this is a very, let's say, uh, uh, convenient chemical reaction. We can make this kind of complex. This is the structure of the complex that you obtain with reacting this ligand with sources of lanthanide ions in the oxidation state three. In fact, you have three ligands, two in one direction and the, other, the third one in the opposite direction, so that these two metals are indeed in equivalent. So in fact, this is, uh, this is what you need to, uh, to make a, a single quantum gain. And so our job now is going to uh, be to prove that we fulfill the requirements that measure uh, 
in, to, to make indeed a single quantum game. The first thing I, I would like to mention is that, well, um, we discovered this chemistry now several years ago, and uh, we, we, we prepared the entire series of uh, alphabets, uh, and so we obtain an isostructural series of this, of this, of this compound. Not prosodymium, which is radioactive, but uh, the rest, yes. So that allowed us to uh, make uh, systematic studies and to uh, see what is the different structural trends that we can have throughout this series of this isostructural family. The first thing I would like to mention, or just in passing, is that indeed, uh, any of these molecules in principle, as I mentioned, would be a good realization of a signal quantum gate. And so we actually were able to prove that for the case of thorium. And we published that back in 2011, so many, many years ago. And so this is not what I'm going to explain today, but what, where can we go uh, from this from this onwards? Okay. So as I mentioned, from this analysis of structural series, we can study trends. And so this is uh, a representation of bond distances, uh, bond distances from the metal to the oxygen atoms. In fact, the sum of bond distances from the metal to the oxygen atoms of these uh, ligands, uh, as we uh, increase the atomic number of the uh, lanthanide metal that we have here in this position and in, in this in this complex. Okay, those are homometallic molecules. Uh, both are the same metal. What we see is that, uh, in general, we, we see clearly that there's a decrease, a contraction of the bond distances. And this is an effect called, called very well known effect, uh, called lanthanal contraction. Okay? So the lanthanal contraction means that the, the, uh, the, the lanthanal ions become smaller as uh, you increase the atomic number. So this is a well known uh, effect. But the interesting thing that we see here is not only the contraction, but the fact that there is always a gap or, or a difference between bond distances in one position with respect to the other position in this molecule. Okay, so uh, whenever you are in the, in the in the period of whichever method you're using here, one position is always going to have longer distances than the other position. Okay, so always have a, a, this differential, this difference between both positions. Okay, and the question is why? Well. If we analyze the structure uh, with this cartoon, what we see is that in one position, we have two of these three bidental pockets and only one of these two mm, mm, bidental pockets, okay? Three or two of these and only one of these. Whereas in the other position, it's the opposite. Two bidental pockets and only one tridental pocket. So this relation between uh, uh, these, uh, these pockets uh, makes, in fact, in general, the bond distances to be longer here than in here, okay? Now, that's interesting, but the most interesting thing is how we can exploit this in terms of uh, synthetic methodology. You can imagine that <clears throat> since we have a, a coordination system that favors longer distances in one position with respect to the other position, this could be exploited to make uh, heterometallic uh, complexes on uh, dinuclear molecules where we mix two different lanthanides, which necessarily are going to be different in size, as we know, where our system just uh, uh, spontaneously locates the larger metal in one position and the smaller metal in the other position, just thermodynamically. And so making heterometallic, uh, pure heterometallic molecules or with a high, uh, say, uh, selectivity uh, out of uh, using thermodynamic control in one point reactions is extremely challenging. And so the system is very unique in achieving this in a quite easy manner, okay? And so this allows us to make a large collection of combinations uh, so that we can exploit for many different things because it, it, it opens the door of putting two different metals together and see what is the uh, synergy that you need to study for, from the point of view of photophysics, magnetism, or whatever between two different metals in one molecule, knowing that you only have these two metals and you know where each metal is in this point, okay? So we've been able to show uh, to, to show that uh, this activity will throw out a, a variety of techniques. Uh, in fact, uh, I just put a few of them here. We have other, other methods that allow us to corroborate this activity. Here I show, for example, the mass spectrometry 
in color, there are simulations of where you can expect the trace of the mass uh, spectrogram for different distributions of metals, homometallic ethereum, uh, homometallic lanthanum, or the heterometallic one. But the gray trace is the experimental one for this compound, the heterometallic one, and there is no nothing, not a, not a, not a trace or, uh, or uh, any distinguishable signal for the heter for the homometallic uh, uh, moieties, demonstrating that uh, indeed this system is pure and excellent. So uh, these are some of the ethical relations that allow us to rationalize the certificate in terms of uh, stability of uh, the system where the metals are at the right position. So we have here various pairs of metals. And we study theoretically what is the energy of having uh, the metals put at their preferred positions and uh, swapping them and putting at the positions that they don't like. And so the uh, energy of this uh, of this process, uh, this is the energy cost of undergoing this process, uh, increases as the as, um, difference in atomic radius of the two metals that are involved uh, grows. And, and, and the, the energy values are quite remarkable, which explains the good sensitivity of this, of this system. Okay, so an experimental way also of showing quite remarkably this sensitivity is this, again, extensive study where we have now uh, made uh, and obtained the single crystal structure of the series where we have in always one metal, which is prosodinium, and every time we change the nature of the other metal. So we have prosodinium with lanthanum all the way to prosodinium with tissue. And so we, we study the, the, the structure of all these molecules. Okay. And what we see here is a beautiful uh, picture uh, where we see that uh, here in orange, uh, this is the, uh, the parameter of all distances for prosodinium. Prasnodymium, which is together with a larger metal, takes the position of the small metal. And so here are both distances of, uh, to lanthanum and to silicon. This is the homometallic molecule to prasnodymium. And then when the prasnodymium is together with a, a larger metal, prasnodymium takes up the position of the, of the uh, sorry, when prasnodymium is with a small metal, okay, it takes prasnodymium the position of the large metal, and leaves the position of the small uh, metal to the other, okay? And then as we go along the, the period, now the smaller metal becomes smaller, 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 the distances become smaller, the gap increases, and the distances around prosodymium remain uh, pretty much constant. So structurally, this is a very elegant, also, let's say, demonstration of this uh, selectivity. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, in terms of trying to portray this as a good or too cute quantum gate, we choose a system. Now we can choose metals. Now we can choose the system that suits better or purposes. And here we choose uh, two very different uh, metals uh, magnetically, erbium and cerium. Okay, here we, we can see that the, uh, the electronic structure is completely different. So two very well differentiated qubits. Also, we have a small amount of nuclear, of nuclear spin. No nuclear spin for zero, very little nuclear spin for uh, for Earth, which is uh, interesting, important because uh, the nuclear spin is detrimental to the quantum coherence. And so, um, and so, we we examine this molecule in detail to see whether it could uh, fulfill the requirements uh, to act as a zero quantum gate. And so, in order to do that, uh, we are interested to investigate. Each qubit independent, independently from the influence of the other qubit. Okay, and so to study its magnetic properties in its own environment without the influence of the other qubit. And synthetically, we have the tools to do that because, uh, well, if we are interested in uh, 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 let's say the electronic structure early uh, without the influence of cerium, so we can put alpha here, which is diamagnetic, and uh, alternatively, to study cerium, we can study the molecule with yttrium on the other position, which is also diamagnetic. So, we, for example, uh, use this uh, 
<coughs> these molecules with a single tube molecules, so to speak, to study well, for example, how well separated the ground state is from any other excited states. So here is the doublet that we uh, explore as qubit with a separation of 43 Kelvin approximately from any other excited state. And, and also for uh, cerium, we have even a much larger separation. Uh, so we, we can work with this effective SE as one half as, as qubit without worrying too much about what's above uh, in terms of magnetic states. And also, we determine the structure of the of the uh, of the G tensor of the qubit uh, using uh, and simulating a continuous wave EPR, um, and then we compare this. Uh, so this allows us to get up the Hamiltonian somehow of the of the of the low temperature relevant Hamiltonian of this uh, system. And uh, to complete uh, the study, we just compare the same type of uh, determinations, magnetization measurements, EPR, <coughs> with, uh, with, with the, the, when the two qubits are together. This is, uh, allows us to get an assessment of the coupling existing between these two qubits, which is the ingredient also that is necessary, as I mentioned before, for the signal quantum gate. And so uh, with this, uh, we we have uh, enough, uh, let's say, quantitative information to put together a semi-quantitative uh, diagram, uh, energy diagram of these four states that we exploit as the four, uh, as the computational basis of this two qubit system. Here again, uh, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. <coughs> And so how it evolves with uh, the application of a magnetic field. And so if we have a specific uh, energy resonance that can allow us to undertake the transitions between those uh, states, what we do is to choose the magnetic field that allows us to uh, selectively just a, a stimulated transition corresponding to the signal quantum gate. So in this position, in the, under this magnetic field, this molecule would behave as a signal quantum gate when we use uh, to realize this quantum gate uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation of this specific energy. In this case, this is the energy of uh, X band EPR, the 90 gigahertz. Okay, so in fact, uh, this is uh, the uh, EPR of the system. And uh, here comes another interesting ingredient for. Uh, thinking of this as a possible organization of a quantum gate, because this is an, an echo-detected EPR. So an echo-detected EPR is, uh, as the word it say, says, it can be detected only if after a sequence of pulses, uh, the ensemble of molecules generate an echo signal, OK? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, OK, so. And the fact that we see an echo signal uh, and uh, that can be detected with four CPR is a, is a demonstration that uh, the system exhibits quantum coherence. So at some point, uh, the different speeds can be refocused uh, in, a, in an echo signal. And this only happens when the system shows a certain amount of quantum coherence. OK, so this is the, this is the, uh, the uh, already the, the good, uh, let's say, news uh, of the fact of uh, being able to detect an echo uh, uh, EPR for the entire uh, magnetic field. So this is the EPR spectrum. And uh, we can actually focus on the specific transition that is of interest to us, which is this uh, signal quantum gate. OK, here is the position of this transition. <laughs> and we can, in, let's say, analyze more in detail the spin dynamics of this transition. OK, and, uh, and so for example, here I, I show you the, uh, the uh, intensity of the echo as we uh, vary this uh, delay uh, that we use uh, for detecting the, the signal. And uh, so fitting this, uh, fitting this data, uh, this decay allows us to obtain the uh, so-called phase memory time or the spin, spin relaxation time. It's not spectacular, but it's uh, it's very nice to be able to um, close the entire picture and even uh, show that we can characterize the spin dynamics of this of this uh, of this prototype. Okay. Okay. So last part of the 
the talk, uh, we go back to chemistry. We discovered that we can make heterocatalytic molecules by combining these two types of coordination pockets, the identity, because this is a deeply coordinated like pocket, and this is a beta like ketone. Okay, so chemically, uh, we thought that we could exploit uh, this principle or this methodology to isolate other architectures of lanthanides of different with different coordination environments in order to uh, access different types of heterometallic uh, molecules. Okay, and so in fact, this uh, this was uh, this was the intention of this, as you can somehow uh, guess, is that we're going to make trinuclear systems. Okay. With one metal in the middle, different from from the two metal from two metals on the on the sides. Originally, we used this uh, on this ligand only, but it worked when we had these two ligands together. It worked to form a channel into this array with uh, three three uh, three metals, where we have um, we have one central metal that is larger than the other two metals on the sides. Okay. And again, this is because the different distribution of tridentate pockets with respect to the identity ones in the middle with respect to the sides, which favors longer distances in the middle uh, compared to those on the sides. Okay? So this is a system that works for only certain combinations of metals. We need here, we need always a large metal and two, like a small metal, not like the nuclear ones. So it's a more restrictive one. But when you obtain a molecule, <clears throat> you know it's very, very, very pure and robust. Okay, so here I have I shown you some of the molecules we have characterized by single crystal X-ray refraction. The central metal is always larger uh, than the, uh, uh, and it's let's say from the left part of the of the of the period, and the peripheral metals are from the right part of the period. So here, this is this is a spectacular mass spectrograph where we see how how neat this system is, OK? OK, so uh, this uh, allows us, uh, gives us the opportunity to uh, to study more complex, uh, uh, let's say, uh, potential uh, uh, potential uh, quantum, quantum protocols, OK? Because now we have three qubits, three, three qubits. Here I show again a demonstration of the purity of the system in solution through my spectrometry. This is a trace of this particular molecule. These are the ex expected positions of any other distribution of metals. Since we see only this, we realize that there is no scrambling whatsoever of the metals uh, in solution. So it is very remarkable. OK. <clears throat> so we studied, for example, this uh, analog, cerium erbium, as before, but uh, now with three metals, cerium in the middle, erbium in the sides. This is the Hamiltonian that describes the simplest Hamiltonian you can uh, use to describe this as a three qubit system, because we have uh, first uh, the Zeeman the Zeeman interaction with the magnetic field of each of the two level system, and also the coupling the coupling between between uh, between. Okay, it is the only thing that you have in this Hamiltonian. But in order to obtain uh, the parameters of this Hamiltonian, what we do is we study three different molecules or quantum gate, so to speak, and then our molecules will be only have one type of qubit. For example, the one with erbium, we study the erbium, putting lanthanum in the middle, we make this molecule, no problem, works very nicely. We study the cesium by making the compound with lutetium, also diamagnetic. This molecule also is, uh, is works very nicely, very pure, we were able to study in detail. So here we study the central qubit, the so-called axilla, well, reasons that we explain later, we call these two qubits axilla and qubit. So we do again characterizing in detail uh, using uh, magnetization measurements at different temperatures, specific heat at very very low temperatures. That's uh, done in Zaragoza, Pertonix in Zaragoza, or uh, continuous wave EPR. And to obtain the different uh, uh, parameters of the, uh, of the uh, electronic structure of the qubits, we compare again with the quantum gate where all the qubits are together. This again is a good assessment uh, uh, of the coupling between between uh, the central and external qubit. Uh, again, studying uh, 
specific heat, magnetization, EPR. And here uh, we see some uh, values of uh, phase memory uh, time, uh, so spin, spin relaxation time to different magnetic fields. Okay, and so uh, this is the way we uh, we investigate this as potential three qubit quantum gate. And for example, <clears throat> with this information, we can now establish uh, a diagram for the eight states that constitute the uh, eight possible inputs and outputs of three qubits. Okay, and here, well, the different transitions correspond to different uh, quantum gates. For example, the blue ones are two qubit transitions. This is a very nice one. This transition here is the realization of a control control knot. So control control knot quantum gate, which uh, what it does is changing the state of one of the qubits if both of the other two qubits are in one specific position. One in this particular case. So here, this 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 rotation is the uh, uh, or this uh, resonance is the realization of this uh, three qubit quantum gate. So control not going to wait. So that's very nice. It's a, it's a prototype of this uh, of this of this uh, three qubit quantum gate, and we know which uh, magnetic field and which energy is necessary to realize it. Okay, uh, here I just show you this our compound to illustrate how we characterize in detail the spin dynamics of this type of uh, so-called quantum gates. We did that for the Brazilian American in collaboration with our colleagues in, in Manchester. Um, so uh, that allows me to explain a, a little bit better what do we do to characterize the speed dynamics. We do this uh, to, to to study the phase for memory time. Okay, so the phase of this uh, of of our qubit um, uh, and the phase dynamic. So how long you can maintain this phase? We use this uh, famous sequence, which is called the Pan-Echo sequence. We detect, we detect the echo, the echo uh, for different values of the delay. So uh, if we do that at different magnetic fields, we obtain the echo detected EPR. And then if we study this, uh, this the, how this echo decays for uh, uh, different values of tau, we can determine the phase memory time. So here, these points are phase memory time determinations at these different magnetic fields. There is another uh, um, dynamic process, which is the uh, um, spin lattice relaxation time. Is the how the spins relax uh, uh, to uh, to equilibrium, and so uh, basically what uh, what you do is you generate um, you generate an, an inversion of uh, of the state of your of your spin, and then let it recover for a certain time. Okay, and then uh, after you wait for enough time for the recovery. You detect the echo again through a high echo sequence. Okay, so this first uh, the inversion recovery is first inverting the, the speed, letting it recover to equilibrium, and then measure how uh, how uh, which position of the recovery you are after uh, after a certain time using a high echo sequence. And finally, there is another interesting experiment, which is uh, this uh, uh, coherent control or of, of your cube. Basically, what uh, you do with this experiment is to show the capacity of putting your qubit in any in any uh, specific quantum superposition that you want. Okay, and so when you, in order to do that, you uh, generate a pulse um, of, uh, of 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 the uh, appropriate wave wavelength in order to generate a, a superposition. So the longer the, the longer this pulse takes. The further you are in the rotation, okay, and then you can, if this point is very long, you can actually do several rotations, okay, and so you, and this is what uh, you do with this oscillation. This oscillation represents uh, actually going over several rotations uh, depending on the length of this point, okay, and so what you do is uh, after uh, a certain a certain amount of time pulsing, you detect well, you detect the signal. Uh, the, the signal with an echo, high echo sequence, okay? And so if you start uh, in your system uh, and, uh, and in one state, you're going to be in a, in a pure state, and then you go through different superpositions, then you go to the other state, and so on, okay? And so you detect it, you detect it by echo, and then so by changing this, you are actually are detecting these radio oscillations. And so this also gives you uh, an, an idea of how long it takes 
to generate uh, um, uh, to to uh, uh, what's the word to, to actually uh, do what quantum operations. Okay, so the the longer this uh, this uh, Ravi uh, frequency is, the, the longer it is, the longer it takes to do uh, your quantum operations because you need more time to generate a particular quantum superposition. Okay. Okay, so this is the way we characterize uh, the speed dynamics of the system. And then I'm not going to explain the details of this. Okay, this is the quantum circuit. This is the quantum circuit that maybe you are, or some of you are familiar with, which is the so-called uh, two qubit, uh, three qubit repetition code. And this is used to actually un, uh, to realize a quantum error correction of a qubit. Okay, so this is the qubit, uh, and these are two auxiliary qubits that you need to uh, detect and correct a possible error on this uh, on this queuing. And in order to do that, you, you realize the circuit, so you, you do several uh, operations to queuing operations, several rotations, uh, and at the end, a three qubit operations that corrects an error if there is an error uh, uh, on, on, on your, on your queue. Of course, uh, I'm not going to go much more into the details, but uh, this, ca this can be our molecule. And so what we did is uh, we uh, simulated, well, not we, uh, our colleagues uh, in part, simulated uh, how uh, a molecule like ours, with the spin Hamiltonians that were determined experimentally, would evolve okay, uh, to realize a quantum error correction. And it was possible to show that uh, with the real Hamiltonian parameters and the uh, measured quantum coherence, it uh, obtain, we obtain a, a fidelity, so to speak, or a, or a probability of uh, error that uh, it, it's much smaller if we undertake this quantum error correction than if, if, in the absence of any error correction. Meaning that this molecule uh, can behave as a qubit with a build-up mechanism to uh, detect and correct uh, quantum errors, which is quite remarkable. Of course, this is in theory, uh, because we only did uh, measurements on, uh, on the ball, the Hamiltonian, and then did, uh, did a simulation. We didn't do actually uh, uh, reading with, uh, with pulses, but it's, it was quite remarkable to show that in theory, this could be a, uh, a molecule of, of a qubit with an error correction mechanism incorporated. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just to finish, uh, let me show, let me explain you that, of course, uh, we are dealing with molecules, we're measuring them, we're analyzing them, that's very nice, but we're not doing anything really with them. So, in order to do something with molecules, I don't know if uh, we're never going to do anything with molecules, but uh, what we need to, to, to start doing is uh, to see what the, the properties of these molecules, that those properties have been, that I've been uh, <laughs> describing, are uh, preserved when you start putting them on surfaces, for example. And so this is what we did again uh, with our, uh, our colleagues and friends in San Rosa by working with this uh, particular one with the dispersion tool. We did the same uh, studies that uh, allowed us to show that this could be a good realization of a two cubed quantum gain. Here we show, for example, with magnetization that we have in the ground state two isolated two level systems that are not equivalent. So this plateau is the fact that we have two isolated uh, 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 whatever systems. And then uh, this drop corresponds to the fact that they are coupled and different magnetically. But the fact that they don't drop down to zero here very rapidly is because they are not equivalent. So in this case, the anisotropy axes are, have different orientations. So they don't cancel each other, even if they couple and different magnetically. Here with a specific heat also, we were able to uh, model somehow what is the coupling between these uh, two loose qubits. And therefore, uh, again, uh, we uh, somehow uh, show that the, the molecule sh uh, shows the uh, requirements to behave as a, a zero quantum gate, okay, with a slightly different energy diagram, but again, qualitatively, uh, what you need to realize a, a C0, okay? Flipping the, the, the target uh, if the control is up, as you can see here. And so what we did is to 
compare these uh, studies that were performed uh, with crystals uh, in the bullet. I was not going back and forth again. <laughs> it's like there's some, some sort of delay here or something. Okay, I'm gonna finish here. Okay, so um, so basically, um, here we did all these uh, studies with, uh, with with crystals in the bulk. Okay, and so what we did is uh, we um, we deposited films of these molecules uh, in here in this uh, detector of a micro squid. Uh, so basically, we have these coils that uh, generate a a variable magnetic field here, for example, an AC magnetic field. And depending on the magnetization of the system or the magnetic response of the system uh, that is deposited here, this is picked up by this coil that uh, by, because of the difference between the, the current when you have the sample here and when, where you don't have anything here, you can actually uh, detect uh, the magnetic response of what is in here and you can work with very, very small amount of samples, this is a very sensitive system, and uh, you can actually work at very, very low temperatures because I think this is uh, embedded into a dilution fridge. So basically, we did that. Uh, we, we deposited this, uh, these uh, molecules here using a deep panel lithography, okay? And so we characterize that with different uh, surface characterization techniques. And the most important thing is that we measure the magnetic properties of these films. We have here uh, the comparison between the behavior of a variable uh, uh, magnetic field, uh, uh, AC magnetic field uh, of a crystal compared to the response with uh, a film of th about 30 layers and a film with much thinner. Okay. And what we see is the, the, the relaxation dynamics of the magnetization. Is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is basically the same. So the, the properties are preserved, okay? So this is very interesting. This is very, uh, let's say, well, pretty much what we were looking for. And so uh, here I show again a plot of the magnetization of the crystal in this microscope compared to the uh, films. We see pretty much the same behavior Although we see an interesting difference, which is the, uh, let's say, the stiffness of this drop when we couple these two spins uh, uh, antiferromagnetically. And uh, this uh, is the reflect that uh, by putting these molecules on the surface, we slightly change the angle uh, uh, of the isotropy axis between these two qubits. So uh, it's not the same in the bulk than in the surface, but in any case, uh, they still qualitatively the same. We still have an angle of this, these two cubes continue to be uh, in the equivalent. And it's interesting to see that, uh, well, it's not exactly the same, but uh, it still fulfills the conditions that we need. Okay, so the difference between the spin dynamics very similar in both cases and dramatically different from the case where we have only one dispersion ion compared to, uh, to uh, one dispersion ion next to one thermal ion. But anyway, this is. Not so important now. Uh, okay, so basically, uh, um, this is all I wanted to say. Uh, this is what we've done so far. It's quite interesting to, to realize that uh, we can still use these systems on the surface. That brings me to the conclusions. Uh, basically, the conclusions are that we're happy to have a, a legal design uh, methodology to make heterometallic uh, uh, lanthanic complexes. We have now two families of compounds, dinuclear and trinuclear, as we've seen. And uh, well, uh, with this, we've been able to also to put forward two qubit quantum gates or uh, even three qubit quantum gates. Uh, and so uh, also uh, we're starting to see that in the surface we can <coughs> maintain the properties. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the people in the group that have worked uh, on these systems over the years. So most uh, people that have been mostly, mostly involved in this project. Uh, and my collaborators, uh, the simulations, which uh, allows to prove this uh, quantum collaboration, very, very, very remarkable. Or our friends in Zaragoza who uh, have allowed us to do this advanced very quantum position characterization. This uh, uh, professor point in Tarragona for the calculations and 
برای بتونن این ارتیم منچست به بودی ای پی آر پروس دی بی آر ای تنک دی ویریس ایجنسیز فور فاندنگ این بارسلونا این کاتالوگی هم نشنال سورسیز این کسی بیو 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 And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the stimulating talks. So now time for the questions. Um, in these couple um, qubits, um, I see that generally the talks have heard of um, your talk. Uh, you, you're talking about two cubic gates and um, you know multi cubic gates, uh, but can you do single cubic gates? I mean, the fact that the qubits are coupled makes it more difficult to only address one qubit, right? Uh, can you say? so basically? I guess uh, here the important thing is to find a, an equilibrium between the strength of the coupling and the polarization that you have uh, of this of the spin qubits, so that you can uh, still consider qubits as let's say independent from each other, but still coupled. So, so what happens to, to one qubit uh, uh, is dependent on what's happening to the other qubit. The way we do it is just by um, uh, realizing that we have the, uh, the, 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 the different states that uh, correspond to a computational basis and assimilate these states in principle to the well, we do it uh, but with the simulations of the that hand makes hand. it very difficult for a single qubit uh, operation because you need several frequencies to address a single uh, qubit, right? Because you have to do several transitions with multi qubits to be able to factor out the other qubits and leave only one. So, I would say that uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh. It is important to do one single qubit operations with having all the qubits around because if you are interested in single qubits, you can use just mononuclear complexes, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's important to do single qubit operations next to other qubits that at some point are not doing anything. But uh, well, I mean, if you want to show this, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. It was because of this idea of uh, having um, universal one computer with single qubit and two qubit gates and to have everything in the same molecule would be very The way I thought about that is uh, having um, two qubit quantum gates next to single qubits and, of course, finding ways of wiring them mm -hmm. using, for example, uh, which is something we are, we, we are in the process of thinking and trying to experiment, uh, putting these molecules into into hybrid architectures that allow them to uh, to interact with each other, like the superconducting resonators and things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think we're still far away from uh, achieving this. Uh, I don't know if I really answered to your question, but... Uh, Thank you very much, Guillermo. So, uh, so the, the, the measurement that you got for the Coherence time T2, actually, it was a plot inversion on case stamps of the molecules. No, those are on uh, on uh, frozen solutions. A lot okay. inversion. Plot inversion. Yeah. Okay, okay. Then, I mean, then the coherent time is limited by inversion. Yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. Um, this is absolutely the case. And uh, I would say that uh, this is just more like a general thought. That uh, what you can add if you, you you would be able to achieve if you were able to actually control this kind of systems to do these kind of things would be much 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 bigger than the drawback of keeping low low temperatures. This is the impression I have. Uh, but of course uh, that poses uh, a limitation, and one of the the concerns is how you can actually increase coherence at higher at higher temperatures. But yeah, we we that. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. 
Não são de área, isso é e já não tem nem isso de EPR, por CPR, ou não, 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 ou And so we we uh, we start by looking at what we consider that we have a position that is corresponding to the actual form we get uh, to the what we call the CIMA form again, because we somehow also see the four the four pages of states to different geographic uh, uh, states, and so we have to find a position that is corresponding to a specific uh, rotation. And so this is a transition that uh, shows this uh, this phase of my path because we, we work on the uh, other things and this magnetic field. And so you say if you have one of your qubits in a two position, say up plus down, then you can your small, and then you can have this uh, bell state that you create with your Yeah, so I, I believe that when you use this notation in sequence, you use a pulse that allows you for a particular transition that allows you to reach a particular superposition. And I believe from the pulse uh, that you just have a high sequence to, to know the, uh, the, the, the intensity of the head. But you, you reach it and you maintain it for more of it. So uh, the uh, um, the pulse has different variations. So, uh, but, but the pulse ends, and you have prepared. So yeah, the pulse ends, and then uh, I guess there is a delay uh, in this sequence but, uh, before you start the echo, the echo, the high echo sequence. But this this delay can be can be different. And this delay also can influence, of course, uh, the uh, of course influence the. Uh, The, the intensity of the echo and it's related to the the contact of the phase of the time. I believe. I believe it's wrong. I'm not an expert on this because I'm but I'm trying to verify in your comments. In fact, we are, we are getting a, a post in VR in, in Barcelona. It's already there and we're already testing already. So I guess I will be able to have more and more because we don't have it there. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, one question regarding the nuclear species you have shown. And you have shown a plot uh, comparing the bond distances or the sum of bond distances of site one and site two. Yes. So I guess that for that you have crystallized uh, all the nuclear all the nuclear species. Yes. So, and they yes. Have them. yes. And so the coordination span is exactly the same. But for example, lateral lateral nuclear species are. Yeah, the location of the nuclear species because that one is much bigger. No? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I like it because it's a, it's a chemical. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is the uh, this is the plot you you were talking about, which I think is a is really a beautiful, a beautiful plot mm -hmm. because it's the reflect of, of a lot of work. <laughs> And, uh, and so you're wondering, okay, how can you do this comparison? Uh, because uh, as you change the, the, the size, very often uh, you are going to change the coordination geometry because uh, you, for larger metals, you have larger coordination numbers. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to get isostructural series of, uh, of this, of this uh, series of metals. And you are absolutely right. But uh, for the entire for entire series, okay, for for the for the entire series, uh, we have these three ligands, okay. There is only one difference that occurs when you go from gadolinium to uh, the next metals, which is you see this nitrogen ligand here. <laughs> Exactly. This is a nitrate. From here to here, this nitrate is didentate. Mm -hmm. And then when the metal becomes too small, it becomes uh, uh, monodentate. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the, for the case of gadolinium, 
we have uh, both in the same structure, there's disorder between both. So you, you see clearly you are at the border. Mm -hmm. But what we are comparing here, this doesn't really have an influence on, uh, on what we're interested in. And uh, because we are comparing here the distances to oxygen atoms only of the ligands. Also, this, this small difference mm -hmm. of the nitrate doesn't influence the rest of the scaffold. Also, we look at the distances to the oxygen atoms of the fixed ligands. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, we also have a several complex where we have instead of nitrate chloride. And uh, this is the same for all of them. So in, uh, I said isostructural, but uh, you were very, you know, in this it is quasi isostructural. And for the pur or for, for purposes, is is actual structure. But thanks for 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 making this question. Um, I think that there are some other molecules related also to the lanterns. Yes. So how do we work with this in terms of the cubic performance? Because we are starting ourselves in this area, and we know that it's hydrogen atoms are very near to the lanterns. Is going to bring the yeah, so about quantum coherence. So when we're talking about optimizing quantum coherence, uh, we haven't done it yet to a great extent, but uh, but uh, this would be one of the things that you can improve. You can change water by butane or water, for example. In fact, uh, we, we studied this quantum coherence in frozen solution of methanol, uh, and so we believe it's no water anymore. Because in solution, uh, we, we think this water is substituted by alcohol. Uh, so you can, you can play with water. Mm -hmm. And so far, uh, well, we have obtained these quantum coherence that are, let's say, measurable and decent. But uh, I'm, I'm sure there are ways of optimizing. So, you know, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so let's thank the Geomic. <laughs> <laughs>